Hello, uh, welcome to Secrets and Powers LARP 101, playing, writing, facilitating, and growing community. And my name is Olivia Montoya. I use she, her pronouns, and I've been playing Secrets and Powers LARP since 2013. Hi, my name is Akata Felton. I use she, her pronouns as well, and I've been playing this type of LARP since 2012. So the first question that we're going to answer is, what is a Secrets and Powers LARP? First, we need to define what LARP is. LARP stands for Live Action Role Playing, and getting more specific than that leads to contested territory. But for the purposes of this discussion, LARP involves physically embodying a character, acting as your character within the space of the game, at least some element of live play, an understanding that the game space is separate from the real world, an understanding that the character one plays is not one's real self, and as many of you know, not all LARPs involve foam swords or vampires. Which brings us to secrets and powers. Once again, the definition can be a little contentious, but for this conversation, for most secrets and powers LARPs, Characters are pre-written. There's a uh, pre-existing world building and pre-existing plot points to be discovered. And plots are integrally associated with the characters. Characters have secret information relevant to themselves, the world of the game or other characters, the revelation of which facilitates character interaction. Characters have abilities or powers, mechanically defined actions that they can use to influence the game world or other characters. And they commonly have a higher level of ab abstraction in mechanics. For example, using a mechanic with a deck of cards to represent lock picking. So where exactly do Secrets and Powers LARPs fit? Some people may classify it as a subform of the literary form or lit form genre, but then we have to define lit form. It seems to have been independently invented multiple times, often arising from college campuses, murder mystery games, or people who wanted to act out their TBT RPGs. While the term is American, these games are more commonly associated with New England LARP culture. Uh, and there are many games written by non-Americans um, and non-New Englanders that fall into this genre though. Secrets and Powers LARPs can be contrasted with American freeform LARPs, which generally rely on players to create world building elements and characters as a part of preparing for game. And many campaign LARPs and destination LARPs rely on players to create characters to bring into the world created by the story writers. So maybe we can call these sandbox LARPs. Modules are available for players to opt into, but they are not always customized to the character. And other terms that exist in this space include parlor LARP and theater LARP, but defining them is outside our scope. So here's a few examples of Secrets and Powers LARP. Uh, one of the most well-known examples is The Final Voyage of the Mary Celeste, which was published as a book. Um, here's a picture of it. And so, some games run at Intercon, uh, B-Con, the Bubbles, Consequences, Summer LARP, and similar LARP cons include Dance of the Dragons by Allison Joy Schaefer and Brian Rickberg, uh, a reunion at, reunion at Cat Mirrors by Sarah Terman, and MIT Assassin's Guild games and games using their real, rule set, which have gone to, on to be played outside of MIT, include The Neptune Ball by Akata Felton and Jeremy Cole, and Tartarus by Tamison Wollers, commonly run at Intercon. And here's a few exciting things about Secrets and Powers LARP. If done well, players will have built-in character connections and things to do in game. This is really great for players who are shy or don't know other players beforehand. And it's great for players who want more structure in their game. And they can also often be played in relatively small spaces, so they're really great for cons. And they're great for people who don't want to create their own plot at LARPs. And they can be replayed with new groups of players. And they're great for running on college campuses uh, because of liability issues around props and that, that can make it difficult to do other styles of LARPs. And like many other uh, short one-shot LARPs, these don't necessarily require preparing lots of expensive props and sets or crafting knowledge. So there are some challenges for writers of this style of game. 
they're very time consuming to write. It's essentially like writing a book. So there's a high barrier to entry for writers. And it can involve printing out and preparing lots of bits of paper. <laughs> it's time consuming and that can be really expensive. So, and they're harder to run online than less mechanically heavy games. So they require modifications to the game or using different tools. So here's some challenges for players of this style of game. They're not ideal for players who want more flexibility in what characters they play or the ability to create their own character from scratch. The exception is bespoke games, which can, con can, which can consequently lack replayability with a new group. And there's more prep work for players with more to read, understand, and prepare. And uh, therefore, there's a higher cognitive load to keep track of than more freeform LARPs. And they're not great for people who want uh, more immersion, unless you're at the rare Secrets and Powers game with high production values. And games cannot usually be replayed by the same player. And communities that run these games consistently tend to be insular. All right. So thank you, Olivia, for a little bit of discussion about what are Secrets and Powers LARPs. I want to talk a little bit about how we go about actually playing one of these LARPs. So first of all, what is a player, what can you expect from your GM? So your GM or your game master or storyteller, whatever the term is that your group uses, is going to pick a game that they want to run. They're going to recruit some players. They might find them from a convention, a mailing list, just asking around friends, lots of options. They're going to cast players to characters. This means they're going to assign you a character to play in the game. They're going to send you detailed information about the game and your character to read before it happens. They may or may not host a rules briefing session to provide time to review mechanics, answer questions ahead of time, or you might end up doing that on your own. Then they're going to prepare the game space and run it for you. Uh, so what should you do as a player to prepare to play for one of these games? Uh, please answer your GM questions about casting in a timely manner. Read the game materials that we provide. Ideally, more than once. We've mentioned there might be a couple of them. Think about your character a little bit. You'll have things your character is trying to accomplish and people your character knows. If you need to make any preparations, that will support you in remembering these things. But please don't create new aspects of your character or the world or discard aspects that already exist without clearing it with the GM first. We'll talk a little bit about why later. Uh, go ahead and prepare any costuming that you choose. Not every group is going to require or even encourage it. Don't hesitate to ask if you don't know. And lastly, please, please, please show up on time. Once you show up, how do we actually play these games? Well, you should expect to spend most of your most of the game in character. Talk, run around, take actions as your character rather than as your player. Staying mostly in character does not preclude steering, however. Uh, you as a player still get to choose actions that can direct towards the story that you're interested in telling. Um, you may have heard of the term play to discover. Most Secrets and Powers LARPs do not support extended player negotiation. Instead of arranging ahead of time with the other players, play your character. With an eye towards the narrative, react organically, and interesting stories will fall out of it. You can and still should telegraph your actions, though. Give your fellow players cues about what you're about to do so they can mentally prepare. And lastly, some of these games are going to have surprises that will change parts of your character's story. So maybe that sounds fairly similar to how you run your game. Uh, so what might be different about Secrets and Powers from some other types of LARP? Um, there's a limited control over your character's backstory. Uh, the backstories are generally going to be written by the GM or by a writer if the GM is borrowing the game. You're going to embody that character rather than creating one yourself. Uh, the writer will have created goals and contacts for your character, eliminating the need for players to establish such things on their own, either ahead of game or during workshops. Um, your safety mechanics are not always going to include lines and veils. Instead, because your GM already knows what content exists in the game, they can convey it to players before casting, and you can opt in or out of game based on that. Players can express their level of comfort with this content through the casting survey. 
This is part of why it's so important not to create new content without clearing it with the GM. Uh, player versus character knowledge is often a much smaller gap. Players are rarely going to know things that the character does not. And then lastly, this is something that is the same, hopefully with all types of games, players are still more important than the game. If something isn't working for you, go get the GM. They'll be able to help fix things, often while preserving the game, maybe adjusting it some way so you can continue playing and enjoying yourself. So we've alluded to this a couple of times. One of the really cool things about Secrets and Powers LARPs is letting go of narrative control. Secrets and Powers LARPs are a collaborative storytelling experience that is achieved through shared control of this narrative. You're not going to have complete control over what happens to your character. The author and the GM might have mechanics and things about the world. They're going to impose limitations on what you can and can't do. And your fellow players, those characters, are going to have knowledge and they'll make decisions that are going to impact your character's story. You are participating in telling the story. You validate the narrative decisions of your fellow players by practicing yes and. We tell this story together. Trust that your character's story will be richer and more interesting if you allow others to contribute to it. All right, Olivia? So next thing we're going to talk about is how do you write Secrets and Powers LARPs? Writing a Secrets and Powers LARP is sort of like writing a book. It might be a short book, but it might also be a doorstopper. There's an easy way to break it down into easier to handle parts. So here's a roadmap of what this part of the presentation is going to look like. You, uh, in order to write a Secrets and Powers LARP, you want to find a team, brainstorm, design the scenario, sketch characters and plots, write the world, write the characters, write the mechanics, and then design the game space. And as you go, you make sure you consider game balance slash playability and safety and accessibility. So finding a team or not. So first things first, decide whether you want to write alone or with a team. If you're working with a team, you're probably going to want to set up regular meetings for accountability. If not, you might still want to find a buddy to keep you on track. Uh, if you're going to put together a team, you may want to find folks that have different skill sets. You might want to find people who are good at writing world and lore. Uh, creating characters and connections, producing content, like the actual writing down of your game, technical stuff like software and writing tools, coming up with mechanics, and project management and people wrangling. Uh, we do highly encourage you to set your expectations for the writing project at the beginning so it doesn't fizzle out or surprise people with how much work it turns out to be. So this is the part where you brainstorm. Think of possible scenarios and premises, world information slash settings, factions, themes, character, uh, characters and character archetypes, plots, and they don't necessarily need to connect to each other at this point. You are basically drawing a bunch of ideas at the wall and sees what resonates with the team. And once you're out of new ideas, you can group them by similarity and start to see what rises to the top. Absolutely. So kind of our next step is designing the scenario. Generally, Secrets and Powers LARPs are going to occur in real time without significant breaks in one general location or a cluster of nearby real life locations. So questions you want to ask your team. Why is the LARP happening now in the world and not tomorrow? What's happening in the scenario that means it makes it important now? How long is the LARP? What happens at the end of the game? Why does the game end when it ends? It's often useful to have an in-game reason that things need to be accomplished before the end of the game. For example, if a spaceship is leaving never to return, uh, why is it important that these specific characters are here and not someone else? This can be related to the scenario and or the other characters present. What else is going on at the same time? It's going to help you create additional content for characters to play with. So the next state, uh, the next step is sketching out characters and plots. Oops, sorry, Olivia. Just a little lag here. Please continue. You really want to make a character relationship web. 
This helps you visualize the built-in relationships, both positive and negative, to explore in-game and notice if someone is underconnected. Include connections that cross faction lines to tie the game together into a more coherent whole. You want to assign characters to plots and define character goals. Make sure each character has enough plots and goals to explore in-game, which depends on the size and length of the game. Goals should be concrete. How will the player know that they accomplish the thing? Role play points are not plot. Example, you're the king. You may need to invent new plots to fill out characters. All right. Once you've got a sketch of what your characters might look like, it's time to write the world, which is the first time we're really actually sitting down and writing stuff. This is kind of the hard part, in my opinion. Uh, if you can, try and restrain yourself and don't write the characters first. You don't want to have to rewrite large parts of them after you change something about the world. So write things that all the characters know, such as world information, and then work your way down to more and more specific. Do your broad world documents first, then subgroups like factions, a country, a planet, a religion, a profession. Uh, these are both sometimes called blue sheets. Now you get to write the characters. So here's some things you want to do. Do create characters with different levels of complexity. Do create characters with different play styles. Uh, do include plots that require mechanics to solve and uh, plots characters can solve through talking, AKA role play. Uh, connect characters and plots such that each character is, is essential. If the game wouldn't notice if the character was missing, you should tie them more in to more things. Be careful about making your villains too obvious. If it is easy for them to be excluded from gameplay once they are discovered, AKA good guy mobs. <laughs> Wouldn't it be funny if is something that sounds amusing to the GMs, but it might not actually be fun for someone to play. Be careful about making it too easy for one faction to win the scenario. If the conflict is meant to be central to the game, make sure that the sides of the conflict are well balanced. Basically, characters and plots go together in this style of LARP. Absolutely. So once you've got your characters, you know what their plots are, you want to write your actual me the mechanics. So mechanics sheets, which are sometimes called green sheets, can be written at any time, but it's generally best to save them until after plots and characters are solid. These can include puzzles. Um, it's often a good idea to have a dedicated team member to come up with them. Uh, they tend to be more consistent that way. If no one's super good at it, it's a safe bet to Google escape room puzzles or find generators online. Uh, contingency envelopes are another common mechanic. These are ways to introduce information to characters partway through game. Depending on how important, how integral they are, you may find you're writing them as you do characters or later on during the mechanic. Um, Olivia. So uh, one of the things that you need to consider is game balance and playability. You you basically you want to try to keep uh, to give each character about as much plot and stuff to do and potential to shine. You also need to figure out a reasonable distribution of items and abilities for balance. Ah, Isa, do this as a group if you're writing as a group. If you want to weigh game outcomes towards one faction or another, do this intentionally rather than letting it happen by accident. <laughs> Don't make it too easy for characters to get important items in game. They will hoard them. <laughs> and some solutions include limitations on how many items characters can hold or timed mechanics for retrieving items from locations. Once you know what your mechanics are, you can start to design the actual game space. Uh, the game may have multiple in-game locations, for example, the bridge, the med bay, and the cafeteria, which may or may not map onto real-world locations. It might all be different parts of the same big room. You might have to redesign a little bit if you run the game in a new space. You may need to combine things or separate them out. You can spread out your environmental aspect of games across the locations. Don't put all the resources everybody needs for everything in the same place. Another thing to keep in mind that's really important is LARP safety and accessibility. You write your game with safety in mind. 
Safety mechanics are much easier to implement and more effective if they're designed in from the beginning. And here's some general accessibility considerations like uh, legibility of documents, like you don't want really tiny font. Um, you don't want to use like a fancy font that uh, would be difficult for some people to read. You uh, want to consider the venue and the physical accessibility of that space if you have a venue in mind at the beginning. Uh, and we, we have a huge appendix at the end with more considerations that we don't have time to go over. So you also want to keep in mind physical safety, especially if there's any sort of combat or running or props, especially um, if it's a prop weapon. Uh, and you you don't you want to be careful about shouting fire or gun, like people especially uh, don't seem to like that. <laughs> Mental and emotional safety. You want to be able to take a break. Um, you give players time uh, a way to preemptively signal certain if certain topics need to be avoided around them. Uh, they should be cast as characters that avoid this topic, but it, it still might come up. Uh, you want to be able to uh, modify. Uh, modulate your intensity, uh, you want to give uh, players a way to modulate the intensity of interactions, i.e. how does a player indicate to another player that they need the volume lowered? And you want to implement an open door policy that if, if for any reason uh, a player needs to leave the game, allow it. Safety is accessibility. And don't ex don't sacrifice accessibility for immersion. All right. So you've written a game. How do you actually run one? First thing you're going to do probably is cast your characters. A good casting application or survey will do wonders. It will help you a lot. Get contact information from your players. Make sure you know how to reach them. Ask about their interest in engaging with themes and topics that are available in the game. Make sure to ask about engaging with difficult content like squicks and triggers. This is how we're going to cast people in, way, in a way that respects what they are and are not comfortable with. Um, if you have a game with a lot of secrets, you can add extra items to your list if you want to obscure it and say some of these will appear. Let us know how you feel about all of them. Also, don't hesitate to follow up with your players. Ask for clarification if you need it. When you actually do the casting, Cast your hardest characters first. These are often going to be your villains, the very complicated characters, or those that touch on the most difficult content, but it's going to vary by group. Resist the urge to typecast people. Just because someone played a great leader last time doesn't mean they want to do it again this time. Try and cast the app that was actually submitted. Uh, for production, we're Printing and organizing all of the material for game. It will take you longer than you think it will. I recommend that you budget about one hour for three characters, which means a 15 character game will take you about five hours. Having more hands to help, for example, a bigger GM team will make it faster, but it's a sublinear scaling. At some point, there are too many cooks in the kitchen, but a fast printer is your best friend when you are printing 500 pages worth of game material. Highly recommend try to schedule prod at least a few days before the game. This will help ensure that you get rest the night before. On the day of the actual game, plan for about one hour of setup per eight players. Very simple games with very little setup will obviously be a little bit faster. Complicated ones will take longer. Um, more GMs definitely make this one go faster. Um, absolutely make sure you eat and hydrate. Caffeinate if it supports you. Even if you don't feel able to eat until after the game starts, make sure you have food on hand or a plan to get it. And have a way to contact your players. A phone number is usually ideal, especially for in-person events, so you can call them if and when they are late. So make sure your players can contact you as well. Life happens, things come up. Carry your phone with you. Turn the ringer on. And give them a chance so you can give them a chance to be proactive about contacting you if they're late or if something has come up and they're not going to be able to show. Once the game actually starts, one of the coolest things about Secrets of Power games, in my opinion, is they are generally designed to kind of run themselves as much as possible. This means that you should have at least some free time to be able to wander around, silently observe the players interacting with the story that you created. 
there'll still be plenty of calls for a GM to clarify something or adjudicate some mechanic that was too complicated to implement any other way. Take each step as it comes. So, what do you do when things go wrong? So we all know that things are gonna go wrong. But if you can, don't worry about them until it actually happens. Take a deep breath. Think about what you were trying to accomplish. And then think of a different way to try and do it. Consult with your team if you've got one. If you can't think of anything else, ask your players. But trust your instincts. If you think that a particular solution would break something else in game, you don't have to implement it, no matter how strongly your players feel about it. But once you make a call, stick to it. Don't flip flop if you can avoid it. It's going to confuse and frustrate players. Once the immediate situation is addressed, take notes. What went wrong? How did you fix it? And what do you think of the fix? Did you like it? Excuse me. Keep track of what didn't work the way you meant it to. You can always fix it before another run or keep it in mind for the next game that you write. It's a learning process. After the game, make sure you clean up after yourself, especially if you're borrowing a game space. Have your players help. Do your debrief and de-roll, however it is your group wants to do that. Um, a lot of groups will have after parties. Um, this is time for war stories from this game, from other games, and socializing and getting to know fellow players as people. It's kind of an informal de-roll structure. Um, you may want to set up check-in buddies for a couple of days later. You may want to provide a way to contact the GM after the fact, including for feedback. If you want feedback, Make it clear when and how. You are not allowed to not want feedback, not want it at a particular time or in a particular format. You get to set those boundaries with your players. So one thing that I really like to talk about is the future of Secrets and Power Slarp. How do we lower the barrier to entry for new players? Sometimes this can all be a little bit intimidating. For one, you want clear rules and expectations. You want low commitment NPC roles. Uh, buddy systems to encourage people to bring a friend. Um, you, you, because doing something new alone is hard. And definitely provide as, a lot of support to new players. GMs can proactively check in to see if new players understand things and are having fun. And you want to foster inclusion and leadership of marginalized community members in your games and spaces. Invite people from adjacent communities to play. And update older problematic games before running them or don't run them at all. Listen to their concerns. Don't dismiss fears and don't deride other styles of LARP. Reduce elitism and cliques in your community. Make hanging out with new people a social norm. This is specifically for Secrets and Powers LARP, but most advice about community management also applies. How do we lower the barrier to, uh, to entry for writers, though? Well, one possibility is LARP writing events where experienced writers share skills. Mentoring is another option. Team writing games with a mix of experienced and new writers is a great way to teach new writers. Uh, also, boot camps, game jams, Iron GM, which is uh, an intercon thing. Uh, these sorts of competitions are really great. And online tools also make it easier to run Secrets and Powers games. Like LARPBot, which is something that I uh, developed over the course of a year in the pandemic. Uh, and then there's also some other uh, bots for this style of game made by Ray England. You explicitly want to invite in and mentor new writers from marginalized groups. So basically, you're, you want your community to be welcoming to all, including those who need extra support to feel welcomed. And online tools also make it easier to write Secrets and Powers games. Ah. Well, oops. <laughs> Well, the, they're they're there they're there in our final slide, which we'll um, share the slide. Uh, I saw in this chat that's uh, apparently the link uh, wasn't it working, but well, we'll fix that at the end of the presentation. <laughs> yep. And so, if anyone on the chat has examples of online tools, feel free to drop them in the chat. It'll be a resource for everyone. And uh, a good way for to get writers started is to run games that someone else has written. 
and to play as many games as you can to get ideas about how things work and what things don't. And we also want to encourage sharing across communities. So releasing box games on sites like Itch.io and DriveThruRPG is great. And then GMing these games, networking across LARP communities, as conventions like Metatopia are great for this. And we want more to see more online presence for Secrets and Powers LARP groups. Because as things are, there isn't necessarily a lot. <laughs> and intentionally inviting people into the community by reaching out to adjacent communities. Like in this presentation. Now, this is one thing I've been really excited about um, over the past year and or so, especially, is how can you run Seekers and Powers LARPs online? So online games allow players from a much wider geographical range to participate. And they can also uh, feel like they can feel like a, a lower barrier to entry for some players. So like no need to travel, less need for costuming. For others, it's harder, less fun, or doesn't quite feel like a LARP to them. It's, it's really a, a personal thing. So here's a few examples of uh, Secrets and Powers LARPs run online. Uh, TMF Hope is the one that uh, Akata here wrote and for the Discord bot that I created. And then there's um, The Spark, uh, which was run in Gather Town. Um, Sarah J's games, which tend to be run either on Zoom or Discord, and Under the Fairy Hill, which was run at ExtraCon and Summer Larpin uh, this year, and that was on Remo. So thank you for being here and for watching this presentation. Um, here's uh, our contact info, and here's the link to the slides. Um, at this point, um, we're going to grab uh, I'm going to open up, uh, go to the Google Slides and see if I can open them up to everyone now. That is a permissions thing. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> so, well, Olivia goes that. and sees if she can kind of arrange that. Um, I don't know if we had any questions come through or if anyone in the chat has thoughts, considerations, anything they'd like to share. Uh, nothing yet. Uh, other so, uh, hold on, just a second. Um, okay. DRC Punk says we make wikis. I asked them to expand on that. I think that was in response to the. There's not a lot of online presence for uh, secrets and pa powers LARPs, but I've asked them to expand. But other than that, um, th we've not gotten any questions. That's okay. Um, okay. Uh, I have changed the permissions. Hopefully, people can access uh, the slides now. Can we get um, someone in the chat to to confirm whether or not it works? If I'd been smart, I would have had that loaded. Give me just a second. Hold on. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yes, I just got access, so you're good. Awesome. All right. So okay, everyone, should have, everyone should have it, uh, access to these. You can hang on to a copy in case it's useful. Um, if we don't have any questions, Olivia, do we want to roll through some of the appendix information? Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, we've got a lot of extra stuff at the end of this presentation that we thought we might have not have time for, but it seems like we do. Well, can I jump in with a couple of, I, I would love to hear a little bit of personal, like maybe uh, one of you tell us about a time where you really, where Secrets and Power LARP really shone and gave you a moment that was deeply satisfying that was specific to the art form or was shaped by the elements of the art form that you're most excited by? Sure. Um, Olivia, do you have thoughts or do you want me to go first? Uh, go ahead and go first. I'll, I'm gonna think, think about sure. that. <laughs> so the first game that I played, I'm actually gonna leave what the name of it is a little bit quiet. So in case I don't spoil it for people, um, the first game that I ever played was of the Seeds of Power style. I was playing a character who had a long and storied life which included having lost touch with a number of important people. During the course of the game, my character managed to get themselves killed. And so I'm laying there as a player playing, you know, the unconscious dead body, whatever, for my character. And it turns out that my two estranged children 
who had never met each other each happen upon my body and go, oh, no, that's my mother. And they stop and they look up at each other and they go, wait, what does that make you? And that's the kind of thing that the players were every bit as surprised as the characters. And it created this really, this really rich experience of a really tightly connected story. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. Olivia, do you have an example? So mine is sort of a meta example in that, um, in, so we, we mentioned earlier that there are LARP writing boot camps and um, I, I got the chance to participate in two, uh, essentially two week long uh, LARP writing boot camps um, while I was uh, in the, at Stanford University at the, uh, as a part of the Stanford Gaming Society. Akata was there. <laughs> And uh, uh, like, I, I feel like I learned more about teamwork and working on a, a, a project with other people um, than I did in like my actual academic studies. Um, there, we learned about version control when you're like working on computers that are uh, in uh, in different parts of campus and <laughs> diff uh, and potentially that could work for like people working anywhere around the world and uh, like a lot of this was it, it, i made i made friends i, I made long-term friends and i felt very accomplished after writing it, it's like that feel, I've, I've never actually finished writing a book but with a team of people i was able to finish a book length larp and i felt like I, I've actually accomplished something, and then and then, then seeing the players uh, play in the world that I created, with, uh, it's just uh, a, a feeling that you can't really replicate anywhere else. <laughs> I love the fact that you become radiant when you're talking about that experience. Thank you for sharing. Uh, DRC Punk says, in response to the, um, we make wikis, and I said, can you expand on that? We create a wiki for our games when we are writing. Secrets and Powers LARPs don't lend themselves to being published in book form. Are you aware of any other ways to sell or distribute Secrets and Powers in, in non-purely digital ways? So that all the GMs can tackle whatever makes sense. Um, so uh -huh. all the GMs can tackle whatever makes sense. This can make boxing a bit trickier. So, um, I'm not, I'm not aware. I'm not aware of anyone who is um, distributing uh, secrets and powers LARPs in a physical way that isn't a book. Um, and I, ha but I have seen people distribute them entirely digitally. Uh, I, there's a few on itch.io. Um, there's some that are on that some that are on GitHub. <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. and yes. a lot of times you tend to have to know the person who wrote it and ask them like, Hey, can we, can we run your LARP? <laughs> mm -hmm. Which is part of why I'm suggesting like we need more online presence rather than just like a network of people who know someone who knows someone. <laughs> so to kind of follow up on that, um, a number of our games moved to GitHub after Google code closed down is the way we manage our version control. Um, I've actually I know of at least one or two Secrets and Powers LARPs that have been successfully boxed. Um, they're fairly simple, though. They're not, like, incredibly complicated. They're, like, seven players in, like, three hours or something. Um, but they do have a lot of fiddly bits to them. So the big thing that really wasn't a thing when I started writing these types of games, but is slowly becoming more common, is we talked about writing mechanics and those green sheets for, like, the things your characters are doing. You can also write them for your GM team. That if you start a document at the beginning of your writing process and run through it as you go, you can actually create a pretty comprehensive guide for what it means to run one of these games. Um, yeah, I've definitely been so, seeing that. <laughs> so I found some success with kind, kind of the same telephone idea that I bring a game to something like Metatopia uh, or Intercon someone plays it there and goes, I would love to play the, bring this to my own group. So I say, sure, you can do this. Let's schedule a time when we can talk. Because if I, that GM guide isn't complete, I might need to tell them things that exist just in my head. 
So that's not exactly a boxing. That's kind of the closest example I've got. I really, I'm really fascinated by the idea of a, a living document that gets passed from community to community, though. That's a really interesting solution. Um, having been connected to the Intercon community for ages, the lack of documentation and the lack of ability to take a game and hand it over to another community so that someone else can experience has actually been an ongoing problem. And that's a really fascinating solution to that. Yeah, I know. I know that um, the final voyage of the Mary Celeste. That there's at least three different versions of it floating around in the ether. <laughs> <laughs> Each one slightly more updated for contemporary uh, sensibilities. Yeah, and I, I'm working on one myself now for the um, for the Discord bot that I created, um, uh, like converting it to uh, bot commands that you can just upload as a text file to the bot, and it'll like set up your Discord server to play it. And then all you have to do um, after it's set up is assign the roles to the players and they can play the game in a Discord server. Cool. Right, and so the, the TMF the Hope has been play tested um, using the bot, um, I think it's like five times now, something like five. that. Um, yeah. And uh, it's it's been successful. It works. People have a really fun time. And uh like it's sort of like a combination of video chat LARP on like multiple channels with um, added uh, like parser based interactive fiction style bot commands. <laughs> if anyone wants to play, get a hold of us and we'll arrange, we can totally arrange that. Awesome. Um, I will make sure to add uh, your contact information to for people that are listening to the uh, panel talk channel over on the Double Exposure Discord. Um, we have a question from Dan O'Hanlon. Are there tips and tricks for dealing with player no-shows? What can you do to write secrets and powers, games and characters that are more resilient to dropouts? So that's kind of the million dollar question. Uh, something that we did mention in this presentation is that when you go to write your characters, if the game runs without a character and the game doesn't notice, then that character is probably not done yet, that you want to include more things. So from that, like in that sense, we are trying to design a game that is not robust to no-shows. But we also mentioned life happens, and sometimes people just can't show for whatever reason. Um, honestly, honestly, the best I've found is that no matter how central you think a character is, the game can probably survive without it. Um, I wrote a game called the Neptune Ball, uh, which is hosted by, like, the king of a country. And one of our players was playing that king and didn't show up for, like, the first hour of game. They were running late. Which, okay, so there's some mechanics and there's some pieces of information, which, as a GM, I'm you have to know what those are and be able to kind of redistribute those on the back end. So I mentioned that GM guide. That GM guide can help you, even if you're the one who wrote the game, be more robust to that and reassign things out to cover for a missing character. Uh, but sometimes you get really, really cool experiences out of that. Like the king's daughter and the king's advisor spent 45 minutes trying to contain the diplomatic disaster that was the king isn't here. And it became a meaningful and interesting part of the story that this character wasn't here. So, I don't know, sometimes you just let it happen, and that's okay too. Also, um, if you have a wait list of people that where you weren't able to cast, keep their phone numbers on hand in case uh, they might be able to jump in at the last minute. Um, it might be a little bit difficult, but I've seen this work in a lot of cases. I've been that person in a lot of cases <laughs> who jumped in at the last minute. And if you have a big enough GM team, you can sometimes have one of the other GMs step in to cover a role if you need them to do so, like for a short, either a short period of time or kind of playing an NPC version of the character. I've actually had a really great experience once where I jumped in to play a character that from someone who dropped a game. And like, I had no idea what kind of character I was going to get, but I was open to receiving any sort of character. And I ended up playing like, not the kind of character I usually would have played, but I had a great time. I got to play a sort of uh, like 
a sort of villain character. And I usually don't play villains. And it, it was like weirdly cathartic that to be able to like pretend to be nice for a while and then at the end like betray everybody. <laughs> That actually sounds kind of magical, that whole, like, I've got this up my sleeve, and now you know it. <laughs> it's it's one of my favorite things about these types of games, is that there really can be surprises. Like, we read new books, and we watch new movies, and we don't know what's going to happen in them. And we get to experience that as, like, a kind of a more passive consumer. When you play these kinds of LARPs, you are participating in that discovery. And I think that's a really neat and reasonably unique experience that I really enjoy. Excellent. Um, audience, do you have any other questions for our panelists? We are at 15 minutes out. Um, I Is there something that you guys want to jump to while we let the audience sort of cogitate. Yes, we, we do have the uh, appendix at the end. <laughs> okay. We, wanna, we can start with some of the accessibility stuff. What do you think, Olivia? Yeah, yeah, there's time for it. We should definitely cover that. All right, so I'm going to skip through a couple of slides so we get, because the, the accessibility stuff, I think, is the second set of things, okay? Yep, let's just skip through those first two. I'm going to flip through these. All of this information is available in the slides. If folks are interested, these are just some definitions, various like terms we may have referred to, or you may see groups, other groups refer to. Um, there's a whole bunch of other game writing resources. Um, yeah, this um, is what we forgot to paste into that other slide. <laughs> yep. So there's a whole bunch of these here. Again, they're all available on the uh, on the slides. If you grab that Bitly link. All right, the list was longer than I thought it was. All yep. right, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about some of the other accessibility considerations. We touched upon them earlier in the presentation, uh, but these are some of the ones that we wanted to kind of point out. <clears throat> uh, these games have a lot to read, both before and during the game. Um, there are a number of groups for which this can be challenging. Uh, folks who are dyslexic, uh, who are blind, have other or other reading challenges. Um, so we highly, highly, highly encourage dyslexic friendly fonts, providing game content well in advance so people can take as much time as they need. Um, and something that's not listed on here is being available as a GF. That, for example, I'm always available to go over material with players. That if I need, you know, if I need to sit there and read stuff out to people, I can do that. Or providing things digitally, not just on paper. So they can use a screen reader. Um, Olivia, you want to talk about the next one? Uh, 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 one of uh, one of the. One of the one oh, oh, I'm getting some echo. echo. Mm. Hmm. Let me let me mute real quick and see if that's mine. Ah. So uh, one of the things that could potentially be an issue is the fact that talking is used to communicate, which can be difficult for deaf or hard of hearing players. Um, one potential um, uh, solution is to uh, hire an interpreter or ex avoid exclusively sound-based mechanics. I've uh, I I've heard of LARPs uh, that uh, involve some sort of sign language, um, or, uh, but I'm not super familiar with this. Um, also, uh, these players will often have their own like they already know what works for them and listening to them uh, can give you a lot of information about how to be accommodating. Um, these LARPs will often have large groups of people talking at once, which among other things can be challenging for uh, folks with auditory processing considerations. Um, we highly suggest uh, off-game quiet spaces, um, as well as just writing in reasons to avoid large groups congregating extensively. Uh, secrets and powers games are often about secrets. And if you've got a secret that you don't want to reveal to the entire group, you need to slink off by yourself. So writing in reasons for people to separate is a good way to kind of help with this. 
another thing that can be an issue is the fact that uh, some of these games have content that uh, is spread out across a large physical area. So this can be difficult for people who use wheelchairs or have difficulty standing or walking for extended periods of times, um, extended time periods. Uh, so you may want to rearrange your game space if possible, like bring things closer together and write characters who have information brought to them. So you can uh, uh, give that character to someone who uh, may have difficulty otherwise. Um, similar consideration is simply game spaces that have things like stairs. Um, Wheelchairs and other mobility aids can often struggle with these. Uh, so rearranging your game space if you need to, right? Again, writing characters who have the information brought to them, or writing characters that work in pairs. Um, so that you can pair people up and someone who's more mobile can run out and bring and get things and bring them back is a great way to help uh, accommodate for these things. getting a loud sound okay yeah I think uh, a little distracted so we still have a little bit of time uh let's it doesn't seem that there's any more questions asked we could go over some of the terminology or some of the resources that are out there and like um uh, recommend specific things pros and cons sure um let's see i would say that probably the writing resources might be the more interesting one than just kind yeah. of reading off the <laughs> definitions so a lot of the advice that we gave to you is based on our own experience with the first document um, listed here. Um, it's the Definitive Guide to Writing Guild Games for the Rest of Eternity by Jake Beale with help from Joe Foley, which is uh, a, 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 it was a, it's a guide written by, uh, well, written for the MIT Assassin's Guild, which is where uh, it, where the style of LARP that we both initially learned originated. <laughs> And there's a lot of great advice in there, and it's available for free download. And uh, the LARP Out of Character YouTube channel also is a wealth of information and other sort of uh, similar and adjacent um, presentations to this one. And uh, LARP Writer is uh, something that I, I have uh, fiddled around with slightly, but I've never written an entire game in, but it looks uh, like full, uh, uh, full fledged. Uh, you can build uh like uh the different types of game elements and connect them to each other ah someone asked a question mm -hmm. yep the uh, question is is a secrets and powers larp without powers still a secrets and powers larp <laughs> or is that is uh oh there's so many um arguments over definitions when it comes to this sort of thing but um some people might choose to still call it secrets and powers even if it isn't the most accurate way of describing but that's part of where the term lit form has arisen in um at least in the intercon scene and like the new england scene because it, it's talking specifically about games that um have pre-written characters um and like reasons to interact with each other and generally secrets but not necessarily secrets at least um there's character connections that are pre-written the uh, the person who asked that that was only a semi-serious question but i love that you took it completely seriously and that there's an answer there is <laughs> um there's also you know serious answers and silly answers um something that i do want to kind of maybe take a moment to point out is that like powers can mean a lot of things it doesn't all have to be like superheroes, X-Men, Avengers, all of that stuff, your power can be, like, you could have the ability to empathize with someone. That could be an in-character ability that encourages people to share things with you that they wouldn't otherwise do. So when we talk about powers, it can be more than just, like, flashy pyrotechnics and stuff. So, yeah. It, yeah, it, I'm, I'm writing a game... There. I'm writing a game where one of the abilities is to give a rousing speech that makes other people like it makes their combat ability rise for a certain amount of time. Um, and so then like you can like if you have a crowd of people willing to uh, to talk to, then you can do that and then they could like use that tactically. <laughs> All right, and... we... Go ahead. Oh, oh, we, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, yeah, we we're just going to. Uh, point out there there's a few other game writing resources that we've heard of um so Perfect. what 
what we use to write the the games that are like in the MIT style um, that's mentioned in the first link uh, is something called Game Tech or um, the version uh, that the Stanford Gaming Society uh, has sometimes used called SGS Tech. It's it's based on uh, Law Tech and. Uh, it's a little old, old fashioned to do it this way, but um, it allows you to switch out um, like pronouns and uh, you uh, and uh, dates on the documents before and it allows you to create PDFs that are customized to each run of the game. That sounds really handy. Anyone that's ever had to go in and edit those things by hand is going, wait, what? Uh-huh. The, there are no of databases that do it this happens i assume that would be capable of doing it we happen to use game tech excellent all right we are at five minutes out would you like to each uh tell people where they can find you on social media if they would like to follow up with you yes olivia, so uh, yeah so um uh, once again, I am Olivia Montoya, she, her pronouns. You can find me at oliviamontoya.com, which is my portfolio website. Um, you can find links to everything from there. But uh, if you want to email me, I'm metaparadox11 at gmail.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Paradox Revealed. Um, I'm on itch uh, at metaparadox.itch.io. Um, I'm out there in other locations as well that you can find through my portfolio website, like my GitHub is linked on there. <laughs> Once again, my name is Akata Felton. I use she, her pronouns. Um, you can get a hold of me either on my blog, which is updated very infrequently, or probably by sending me an email. Uh, this is the Illuminae Roleplay Society email, which is the nonprofit that I help organize in the San Francisco Bay Area. You can get more information about them at the website there. If you're ever in the area, come LARP with us. Awesome. I think, thank you. I think that's it for now. Excellent panelists. Thank you so much.